story about Dexter Gooding, who has been involved in crime and served time, was deported back to Barbados, and then finds his peaceful village become, has become a, a center for crime. And he sets out full of passion and guilt to change that and becomes a vigilante. And in his quest for justice, he meets Amy, a white Barbadian woman who's got the same goal, but she's using very different weapons to get there. In this program, we're gonna talk about one of the key issues in the movie, race. And we're gonna to talk to some of the actors in the movie, some of the people who work behind the scenes, and also just the average person on the street who can tell us about what their ideas are about race and about how this movie will affect people and how we live our lives. The economically disadvantaged community in the movie is Baker's Village. Um, but there are Baker's Villages in every country. There are some in Barbados. <laughs> um, so do you see economic and racial disparity being a contributor to those kinds of communities? Well, no doubt economic disparity will contribute. I mean, if you, if you don't have the ability to support your family, unfortunately, some will turn to crime and violence. I mean, and this can happen in a low-income family or even with people that you may consider uh, don't need to do it, but because of greed, they uh, choose the path of crime. So, but as for the racial disparity being the, one of the reasons contributing to the differences, I personally don't see it that way. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's more related to the economic side of things. Well, I've heard many horror stories about people going to get loans and not being able to, to get loans simply because, um, you know, being turned down. Maybe this is why so many black businesses um, failed and never really got the financial support. Some of them, in terms of starting up, people had real difficulty in terms of getting loans. Uh, but money follows money. If you're in a position of money and people believe that, uh, that they'll be able to get their money back from, from you, um, as it is seen with, the white, with, the, with, the, with whites who, who have had um, m most of the money over the years, um, people are more inclined to, banks will be more inclined, more often than not, to lend money, money. And, um, and this is why, you know, I'm, I'm not surprised that people would have had difficulty over the years trying to get loans from banks. I'm not too sure how prevalent that is at this time. Um, maybe things have changed, uh, have changed a bit. But uh, this is why government must put certain um, measures in place to allow um, black businesses to, to be able to, to source um, startup capital for businesses. I think that the movie does a, a really good job in terms of showing the difference in disparities between rich people and people who are not as rich. Mm -hmm. I think that to some extent, even in terms of when we were making the movie, and we went on locations where we were shooting where the white people lived, mm -hmm. and you could really see how rich people were living. Mm -hmm. I remember there was one particular house we were shooting in, and there was this when you walked into, you, your house actually went over like a, a pond, you know, and that was yeah, inside the house. That one, yeah. You know, it was like, wow, people actually, <laughs> you know, and so, so you could see that it really just just the I think that that what is important is that even just starting from the locations mm -hmm. that you can go to a location and see how luxurious it is and then you could go to another location which would be a more normal house and the contrast in the different locations that alone showed the difference as it relates to how people how people live which reflected in the whole tone of the movie. People assuming that I'm I'm rich and wealthy and can help them out with their problems because I'm white and I I grew up not even thinking that way. And I know in, in the scheme of the world, I am. I have a roof over my head, I have food to eat, I have a job. These things have brought me to a place where I am. But, uh, but when they assume that I'm rich simply because of how I look, it, it's hard, because I do want to help, but not because you think I should. So we all know that communities like Bakerswood are realities in every country and they're a reality in Barbados. Do you think that racial and economic disparity 
causes those communities to exist allows them to continue to exist? I think that yes, it has a lot to do with economic disparity. Mm -hmm. Because even when you're looking not only in Barbados, but throughout the region and the United States, where mm -hmm. you find that there are ghettos being created. And even in terms, there, there are ghettos being created by where people can't afford to live. Right. Which in turn are impacting on the schools, because you know they have the, the school zoning system. So mm -hmm. what happens is that you find that the schools which are available for the persons who live in, in what are, are described as the ghetto areas do not get the best in education. Right. So it sort of then stops you from getting the best in jobs, which sort of then reflects into economic prosperity because obviously if you can't get the best education, you can't get the best jobs and it sort of restricts it's like you. A downward spiral kind of thing. Well, you know, the whites in Barbados had a 300 years advantage. First, as slave owners. Secondly, as the plantation owners. And so that, that was the advantage that the black Barbadian did not have. So they are 300 years behind. Uh, and of course, the conditioning process, the educational process was such, and it is still such to a greater extent, where you are always prepared to work for somebody else. And that is the situation even today. So you will find that A, the whites among us would have already had that 300 years of advantage through their forefathers. Uh, the East Indians, on the other hand, are very thrifty people, and they always save, and they know what hard work is. But this does not mean that the black Barbadians or the whites in Barbados does not know what hard work is all about. But that is how we are brought up, that if we work for one dollar, we are going to make sure we spend 99 cents, and we will still leave one cent for our children. In other words, I think that we, the East Indians, understand the difference between the need and want. And many black Barbadians fail to understand the difference between the need and want. I find a lot of people are caught up in that. Oh, I don't have enough, lack of resources. Mm -hmm. So they kind of wallow there and, and they watch what the other person has mm -hmm. on the hill. Where really, you know, on the streets, the guys use that as ambition. Okay, this is what I want, this is what I don't have. Mm -hmm. What I see the similarities with the film and the actual Britain's Hill area mm. is that people are so hung up on not having that they lose sight of the ambition. I figure if you don't have, you say, okay, I may not ever get to that point, but let me try to look at what works for these people. We have racial harmony in Barbados because there's a great imbalance and the majority of Barbadians feel comfortable with it. That's why we live harmoniously. But for me, racial harmony should be 92% of Barbadians, the 92% black ones, owning and controlling 92% of the wealth of Barbados. When that is so, I feel that we would then have racial harmony. For me, there would be no racial harmony while that imbalance exists. Because I know why it is so, I know how they got the ill-gotten money and the power, and I don't feel happy or comfortable with that situation. The educational system has been such and was such that they prepare you for either being a civil servant or whether, they, or whether you are going to go into a teaching service or work for somebody else. It has never been the intention of the black Barbadian father who, if he is a carpenter, to say, well, look, I know my son is becoming, you know, a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer or whatever. To see, let me take time out on his weekend from school to teach him how to make a table, how to make a chair. And so they fail in their duty to pass on, to, uh, to give them that empowerment to be something else. So the day that you are kicked out from your civil service job, that he could go and, and, and make a chair, or be a plumber, or be an electrician. And I think, unfortunately, the black Barbadian parents fail to educate and enlighten their children in the job that they were doing. I find the biggest thing in the ghetto and the urban areas is a lack of structure. You know, it's not that you're rich. If you think about rich kids, they don't just get up and say, okay, I've inherited a million. Imagine if they sit on the beach and they travel the world. At some point, it will fade. 
They'll spend it, right. They'll okay. spend it. What the parents teach the kids is investment, you know, to be more family oriented. So if you think about it, the well-to-do kid is coming up in a good home. There's homework, there's set times, there's social events, there's cultural events, there's, there's education, there's religion. It's a balance. My, my dad would take us in his itinerant uh, business and when he going around the countryside selling his wares and so on. Uh, and so therefore we had no weekend. And then after a few years he were kind to us and he gave us a day off. So we had Saturday off, but we still had to go with him on Sunday. So I want to use that as an example for black Barbadians and, and those who believe that when your son or daughter achieve academic education, that that's it all. I think that it is much more than that, that they should, if you are into some sort of uh, other fields, handy work. You know, I think that you should always encourage your children to go also into that field too, just to learn that field. Uh, and I think that that is very, very important. So to, 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 to end it by saying that, yes, it was the educational system that made uh, black Barbadians who could not venture out into the business field because A, they had no capital at that time. And two, but because they were conditioned and the educational system was such that they always were conditioned to work for somebody else. Had the parents of the black Barbadian children, right, thought the trait of their parents or their father, then I think that situation will have been different. But I must say that it is changing now. It's changing now that more and more black businesses is coming up in Barbados. For example, in Swan Street, Swan Street was at one point in time, A was a Jew street, that's what it was called. The Jews used to live upstairs and they had their businesses downstairs. And then came the East Indians in the 30s, and the 40s and the 50s, up to 1970s. You know, East Indians were really running or ruling Swan Street. But now you go, you will find that maybe over 60% of the businesses are black businesses because the East Indians have moved on. And their children are now educated, they are lawyers and doctors, and they are into professional fields. And they have gone into not in a, a small store where you are selling um, you know, clothing and haberdashery and so on. They have moved on, and the black Barbadians have taken on, uh, and they are now into the uh, business and so on. You know, the, the average, so real quick, the average after school for a person in the Aberdeen Heights community okay. would be ballet. That would be in the, in the film. In the film, okay. You know, it would be ballet, uh, football, be a bit of um, after school activities. There'd be stuff like maybe rock climbing, something really different, maybe some travel. After school in the village would be, if you're lucky, some homework, sleep. You know, maybe if you can find something to eat in the house. Mm -hmm. So it is. I think persons need to realize that it is a bit depressing. Not really race, I would say more of a social block. Mm -hmm. You know, that when you come up in a perfect environment, you almost feel like you can be anything. So much has been said about money and what it can do, but anytime there is um, economic disparity uh, amongst the people, you're gonna find that uh, people with more money would be in better positions to achieve uh, things, and um, there's a certain level of of, um, of fear that can come into to place, there's a certain level of control that can come into place when people have money and, and others don't. And um, it, it's not unique to, to this society, but of course it's very prevalent in this society where you have people who have a lot of money and some who don't have money. And um, those are the people who own the businesses. These are the people who wield the economic power in the country. And um, it, 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 it plays a significant role in, in, in race relations because um, here in Barbados it, it, it is the, uh, the black man who, who is, is often the, the one with, with less money. Right. Most communities, the budget dictates what you do. So if you think about an average kid, you know, you're coming up, you want to be a doctor or a lawyer, oh, that's 40,000 or 50,000 to study over the course of six years, nine years, yes. no way. You know what? Right. I'll be a good technician. There you go. I'll study right. for a year or two, then I can help my family pay their bills. So there's always that, okay, I have to go play sports. Oh no, I don't have gear, okay. Well, maybe I'll play a sport that doesn't require gear. Right. Throw all my life. Soccer ball yeah, or exactly. Give me a ball and a pair of boots. 
versus if you want to do an equestrian sport, you know, who buys well, a you horse? Like a horse, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I've watched that over the years, and I, I, as the character and in real life, it has given me a certain outlook. But I think racism is the least. It still exists, mm -hmm. but I say there's a lot of social prejudices. Just more economic. Than yeah, that have come forward race. more than color, because I know a lot of white people that are poor and black people that are rich. Mm -hmm. And it's really the life they lead and by extension the provision for their family that dictates the success. For me it would be silly to presume that a person's business acumen is related to their race. I don't believe there's a business gene in any of us. However, access to resources, access to certain networks, certain trade routes, certain products, certain markets, certain levels of funding, I believe, are easier for some, is easier for some racial groups than for others. And because of certain advantages that a group may have in business totally unrelated to their genetic makeup, those groups may appear to have better business acumen than some others. When that is probably not the case, it's more probably a case of they have a certain set of privileges that the other business people do not have. I think acquiring business, acquiring business loan in Barbados has to do with that particular individual. And I mean, for example, uh, if you are one who have business before, and if somebody, your parents leave business with you, and you are continuing that business, then you, of course, have an advantage over an individual who does not have any assets to show or any collateral to show. And so in that case, I think that the, the white person would have an advantage because he or she would have had that collateral. Uh, Indian, because of his thriftiness and because of his hard work. And again, let me repeat, it does not mean that the others do not work hard. Uh, he would have saved money, every cent, every penny, because you always say that you know a cent is what makes up a dollar. And so that is the attitude, the conditioning process of an Indian. And with the blacks, because of the disadvantage and because of the educational system, where you're always taught to work for somebody, as you know that you may not be saving as much as you would have liked to if you had your own business, and if that business would have been a successful one, and even better if you had had a business that would have been passed on to you from your parents or your grandparents. So in that context then, I think that the white and the Indian may have an advantage. But that is also changing now because we have uh, some shrewd and very good business people in Barbados too. So that is changing, not at the expense of white, nor at the expense of Indian, but the blacks have now been climbing the success ladders and so on. And I think that that augurs well for Barbados and for Barbadian as a community. So you'd say the people in Britain's Hill are having to downsize their dream a little bit because of economy, but it doesn't mean you can't have a dream. It doesn't mean you can't have a dream. It doesn't mean you can't pursue it. Um, and it's to do with the support. Right. It's, I think it all comes down to support. If you get up and you say, okay, I'm from a very poor neighborhood, and you try, there's no godparent there, there's no dad. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of parents are single yeah. parent, especially single mothers. And there's a reason for that. And that's a cycle that just repeats itself. The mm -hmm. dad gets a kid, he goes and gets another. Ah, oh, man, it's not my responsibility. And he leaves yeah. with no regard of how hard it is then for that kid to follow their dreams. Every, I mean, growing up every year, every step of the way, it's a budget. As soon as you walk outside, okay, I need a new pair of shoes. I have one school shirt. Um, mm -hmm. How am I going to get this? And that's always weighing versus, and this is what a lot of kids that come in a good household take for granted. Everything's there. You know, mom, this week I'm gonna do soccer. You know, I'm gonna do basketball, I'm gonna do lacrosse. I'm gonna do eventing, the they switch out, ballet. Uh, they're all very expensive. Right. But the parents have put the steps in place, so. Are races treated equally in Barbados? I would have to say no. Barbados is a part of the world, and the world has a situation where nowhere can we find totally equal distribution of wealth and power and privilege according to class, ethnic group, and race. So Barbados would have to be an anomaly for all races to be seen as 
to be treated equally here. Well, do you think that how much money someone has or what color their skin is contributes to them being in a baker's village or not being in a baker f- baker's village? Yes and no. As okay. in, you have to have some kind of innate motivation to mm-hmm. get yourself out of that situation. Um, Personally, I'm not Mm -hmm. from the richest family or anything like that, Mm -hmm. Um, but I have motivation within me to to better for myself and my family. I just completed my master's degree, did my undergrad, been playing violin for 12 years. I, you know, I've done so much compared to, um, yeah, compared to what people may think that where I should be compared to where, where I live. Um, my community, okay. but it, it was embedded within me to, you know, to pursue more, to go higher. Mm-hmm. And for me, I wouldn't say that because I'm not white, that I'm not going to go anywhere. And I want to encourage other people as well. Um, just because your skin color does not determine where you go in life. It sure shouldn't. It, yeah. sh- it shouldn't. It shouldn't. But some people are so like trapped mentally. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, I'm black. I can't go anywhere. Um, she's white. She's gonna go so far and I'm just going right. to stay here and work at a fast food restaurant or something. Right. There's so much more that you can do, so much potential. self brainwashing yeah. as well as cultural brainwashing too. Definitely. I just want to thank you for watching today and uh, encourage you to go out and see Vigilante The Crossing and if you're interested in purchasing any of the other quality productions by Step by Step, please visit us on our website www.thevigilantethecrossing.com And we also have a Facebook page. Thank you again.